Today we're going to be speaking with Cheryl Gresham. Cheryl is CMO and VP of Marketing at Verizon Value. Cheryl, so great to see you. Thanks so much for coming right, today. Great to see you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. been looking forward to this. Huge fan of Verizon. Been a long time customer. Oh, yeah, good. Uh, and really interested to hear um, how you're continuing to push the business forward. But before we dive into what you're working on at Verizon, I'd like to go into a little bit of your background. Sure. You, uh, amongst other roles coming right out of school, um, spent a lot of time working in the advertising industry at agencies. Right. Tell right. us about that experience and how that kind of helped prepare you to ultimately go on the brand side. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it was um, something I'd always been interested in, even since I was actually in high school. I took a marketing class in high school, and I remember learning about demographics. Yeah. And I found it fascinating as a 17-year-old. Why? And I have no idea, but <laughs> I remember thinking like, wow, if you send different messages to different people, you know, you can, you can, you know, make their behavior potentially change yeah. right and so i i just remember i always thought it was really interesting so you know coming into the agency world what, what i loved about it was a couple things i'd say just the energy of the people you're working with i mean to be in your 20s and working at an ad agency is a pretty yeah, magical like time right it is. And the relationships you build, exactly. working on a variety of different businesses, I would imagine. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And that was, it's funny, I, I I actually just had lunch earlier today with some people and I, I was talking about some of those variety of businesses, right, that I had worked on and it gives you different perspectives and different understandings of, you know, what the goals are, the purchase cycles, uh, you know, are, is someone going to turn right into a QSR? you know, because they're hungry right now, or is somebody going to take six months to research a new Toyota? And so really like learning about the different companies uh, and how their business runs was really interesting to me. And then uh, just learning, the, you know, the different aspects of how we do our work from, you know, I always call it from the hands-on keyboards up. Uh, and, you know, and I am, you know, old enough to say, like, I remember going to like our research team and they would point you to like file cabinets where they had books. Right. And you'd have to like pull the books out and, you know, look things up. And so I'm sure that was super current research. Too, right. 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 Books, right. Exactly. But like it, it just it sort of taught you the ins and out. And I think it makes you a better marketer as a result because you've you've had to do some of that work on your own you understand the pace you understand what's realistic not realistic what's what's possible yeah and so and then and, and then again just it's almost like i feel like an extra layer of college for marketers yeah so you hear that a lot yeah which is really interesting yeah and yeah. some people never leave the agency world right but true you, you decided to um about 10 years out yeah i went to go work at a at a really you know iconic brand taco bell right um, right what was the experience like yeah. working there i mean I, I you know i i if if working at the agency was like college taco bell was an mba okay you know In an, what way? An mba on steroids i mean first of all i will say that the leadership at that company particularly at that time uh, we had Greg Creed as our CEO, and then Brian Nickel came in afterwards. Greg is now doing, you know, some other work, and uh, Brian's over at Chipotle. But you know, incredible leaders there during that time. But I started um, during what we called the beef crisis, and you know, uh, I have a knack for that. We'll probably get to that later. But <laughs> I started during the beef crisis, and uh, there had been some press out about Taco Bell not using real meat. And, you know, sales were plummeting. And so it was all hands on deck. What are we going to do? How are we going to move fast, you know, and 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 fix this? And so uh, probably about eight or nine months into it, we did a complete what we call brand, you know, turnaround. We came around, came up with the idea of Live Moss, uh, rebranding Taco Bell. It sounds so long ago now, but, you know, focusing on those millennials, yeah. you know, who were just coming that of was age, a big deal, right? right? The at first generation time. that grew up with the internet. So they exactly. looked at how they consume media differently. They looked exactly. at brands differently. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, when I, you know, when I got there, it was, you know, 2011, but we were using like our POP merchandising that we used in store. We would take pictures of it and that's what we would put on Facebook. Right. You know, because that's what you did. And yeah. then, you know, you would, it, and it was all about like getting as many followers and yeah. likes as possible, right? Before the evil geniuses, as I like to call them, you know, yes. figured out how to monetize. Programmatic, but, right? Exactly. Yeah. But um, it, it was, it was a great time. The people, my, my colleagues, I worked there, um, have so many of them have gone on to wonderful, um, roles, wonderful places. We've all stayed in touch. Like it was very collegial. And, um, I think we felt really safe too, to push, try different things, 
uh, you know, we have this saying, you know, a lot of people say it, but we, I would say we did it. Best idea wins. Yeah. And, you know, people could come up. And I remember one time an agency or digital agency, we had to go find one because we didn't have one in the beginning, but our digital agency pitched this idea of let's make a movie and let's do it at South by Southwest, which was something, you know, that. important to the brand. And, you know, it, they, they pitched it. This great idea. We ended up making it. And, um, you know, I, at the time, I gosh, I can't remember if he was CMO or CEO at the time, but I remember Brian Nickel in the room was like, yeah, let's go do it. And like, we did it and we, you know, took a big swing and wanted to make sure to, you know, align well with our community, uh, the music program we had established, but then also quite frankly, get people talking about Taco Bell and places that wouldn't normally talk about Taco yeah. Bell, like a Rolling Stone magazine. And so that was sort of our- It's how a lifestyle brand is creative from exactly. just the place you go get tacos, right? Exactly. They also made a hotel, I remember. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. So yeah, and just great people um, that I worked with there. And, and and we have all stayed in touch. We're on text chains and, you know, it, it, events like this, we'll follow up with each other. But definitely, um, I, I think that was a great, great- you know, not only learning experience, but we turn, you know, we turn the brand around. So, you know, after we had that decline, we started hitting all of our numbers quarter after quarter, year after year. And that was really fun too. And we had this mentality of like, we called it BYA, beat year ago. And you always have to beat that. year ago. And what are we going to do? What are we lapping? What's coming up? You know, no surprises, right. you know, and, and you'd have a plan and then you'd have a tested backup plan in place. And, uh, you know, really, I think, learned just some great marketing fundamentals. And again, back to the business, right, of like what's going to drive the business, uh, you know, you know, our our intention was to drive people into the restaurants. And so if we launched marketing on a Sunday and by Tuesday morning, we didn't see, you know, traffic picking up at the restaurants you know, what's going on? Did this work? Did this work? Did this work? And we'd change it. And by Thursday, we'd have something else going on. So it was a really um, great way to learn too about how to move, how to move, you know, at the pace of retail and right. the pace of QSR and those who sit and wait, you know, um, it, you know, you just get left behind. Yeah. And, and so I think, you know, I, I think about that a lot too. I think we operated that way because we were a challenger brand. And I think just the type of people that, you know, we, we had there and, you know, I continue to watch what they're doing and they're, you know, doing, continue to do great things, but you can't, you know, I, I love this saying, um, we can't admire the results, right? Like you have to keep thinking about what's next, what's next, how am I going to beat it? And, uh, I think having the freedom and the permission, right. To take some, take some big swings and maybe you fail, but uh, you've got to try and take those big swings. Yeah. And I mean, being in a place like that, where it sounds like the people were great and the opportunity was great. How do you know when it's time to leave? Oh, because gosh. a lot of people could be it in a situation killer. like that where yeah. they stay forever. Yeah. Did you know it was right? Were you kind of unsure? You jumped over to Mattel yeah. from there where you were for, for a couple of years. Like, yeah. Talk to me about that decision. Yeah. Oh, it, it's tough. You know, it, it, it was, um, it, it was great and it was a tough, tough decision to leave. Mm -hmm. I think what, what I saw with myself was, uh, you know, just probably like many of us do is sort of that career pa planning. Yeah. Where am I going? What's my next move? Is there opportunity for growth? Does that opportunity for growth mean that I stay? you know, in the state that I'm in, or do I have to leave to go live in right. another state? Or the same category, even. Right. you could have stayed in QSR. Exactly, but right. exactly. And, and I will tell you, and maybe it, it ties back to, you know, my time at the agencies, but I also was mindful in my own journey of wanting to make sure that I wasn't the QSR person. Right. Right. And so what, what why why is that important to you yeah i i felt like i would i'd say two things selfishly i just am curious yeah. i i am a curious person i i you know i'm the one who might ask you know the silly question in a room but then maybe other people have the same question and wouldn't ask but you know i just i find myself to be a very curious person and then also i think i, I what i i saw for myself i wasn't i have to tell you i didn't know where I was going quite yet, you know, and maybe I still don't today, but I, I had this mindset of try new things, take different challenges and sort of see where, where life takes you. Yeah. And, and I figured, you know, I would be 
you know, smarter and better for trying something different and a new opportunity came up. Um, it was really hard leaving Taco Bell. The, the people were incredible and excellent. Uh, but it was it was time to make a move. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to jump around a little bit. Sure. Then you, you you later in your career spent some time at two very prolific uh, tech companies, yeah. uh, Google and TikTok. Um, I know both in their own right, very different. Um, right. But how is the technology space, the consumer technology space different than the experiences in CPG, QSR, et cetera, that you had had prior? Oh, God. It was like a hit in the face, yeah. to be honest. I mean, it. I remember... Um, I remember coming into Google, which is an incredible company and people and everything. I, I always joke that Google employees do not know how good they ha are treated. Um, you know, the ones who have only worked there. Um, it's a very good company. Yeah. And but I do remember talking to one of our agency folks that I worked with and and saying, like, you know, I what is going on? They want us to do a special study to measure the Super Bowl. And I think we were doing, it, it, it had been aligned before I came in, but we were doing something in the Super Bowl, just like a unit in the pregame show. And you were working on a YouTube. I was working line. on YouTube yeah. TV, yep. Um, or YouTube business, but th this specific example was YouTube TV, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, what do they mean they need to study the Super Bowl? It's the freaking Super Bowl. Like we, we look at this data, we look at this data, like, you know, duh, but, the, the person I remember that I, I worked so closely with at the agency, she said to me, you know, I think the, the fundamental belief was it, some of the other companies, there was a belief in marketing because the marketing grew the company and, and built the company. And I, I think in tech, right, usually the model and, you know, particularly with an incredible company and products like Google, the products drive the company. If you think about it, most of the most successful tech products were not built from advertising right. facebook spotify google right. youtube they all just kind of had this viral loop to them exactly right? yeah. exactly i remember someone um an engineer said to me once you only need marketing if you have a crappy product right and i was like stunned you know coming from my background i'd never had someone who who thought that differently and that's because those are per utilities so yeah. you're building utility for the consumer so the utility should sort of sell itself exactly I don't know if that's the case with like bottled water right, right? exactly <laughs> exactly but what was so interesting about that and what i love about my experience from being there and 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 getting faced with that i'll call it skepticism right was i think it made me smarter right because i had to be able to explain what the marketing was going to do to drive the business and why the marketing investment would, you know, return the results we wanted and how would I measure that and how would I prove it? Because no one would accept the fact that a Super Bowl spot equals success. Right. Or you had to or, prove right. that it was successful. And I think that that experience at, at Google and, and honestly at, at TikTok as well, uh, made me look at marketing from a different perspective. You can't take for granted that your budgets are always going to stay where they are or that, uh, you know, whatever, you know, bus that business is going to have an impact and that you are a driver of the business. And, you you know, I think about it that way that, you know, you're a stockholder. You want the stock to be good. If spending a dollar on marketing is not going to be as good as spending a dollar somewhere else in the hiring company, a salesperson, right? Hiring an engineer, exactly. And, and that uh, you you have to have more of a I don't know, like a neutral mindset of like, yes, you're the marketing leader or marketing person, but for the success of the company, where's the right? What's the right thing to do? And so I think it 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 gave me a balance in my understanding uh, that you know. Uh, people definitely have different perspectives, different point of views. And, uh, you know, I, I definitely would say I probably understand our CFOs much better now. Yes. Right. Which, you know, I, you need to be really close with your CFOs yeah. and your finance people. So I think that's really what, what helped me there. I mean, there were, there were many things, but that was one of the biggest changes I would say I noticed coming from, let's call it marketing led companies to um you know into the tech space and all these great companies you've you've worked at i would imagine and you mentioned this specifically your time at taco bell is that you've come in contact with such great people right and over time you're moving around how are you able to throughout your career just 
maintain that network? Because I would imagine that's a huge part of your success is, yeah. is keeping in touch with these people, learning and growing with them. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I'd say, I mean, you know, a, a, a funny story I'll share with you, uh, you know, but how do you, you know, how do you keep in touch with the network? But I'll, I'll say this, you got to be kind and you've got to be kind to everyone you work with. And my, one of my favorites is um, when I was at Taco Bell, uh, they had, you know, as we all, many of us did pre-pandemic, I, I call it the caste system of who gets what desks and offices and depending yeah. on your rank, where you get to sit. So the corner I, office, right, right, exactly. Yeah. So I had an office, you know, with a window and, and, and I remember I had this big sliding door and I would get in early, you know, many days and outside my door was this little cubicle and our intern was sitting there. And our intern was, I think, finishing up his MBA at the time. And we would just chat in the morning and uh, he would come with these ideas. And a lot of times uh, he might not get support from other people for the ideas. And he would come and sort of pitch me these ideas and be like, what if we, what if we did this? Or what if we just, what if we could just try it a little bit? And what if we could just do exactly this? Exactly the type of intern you want to have, right? Exactly, yeah. right? And so he and I developed like a friendship, a partnership. And I, you know what? Yeah, let's try it. Let's do it. Let's try it. Let's do it. So anyway, long story short, he continues a, a very fast rise, you know, within his career. And uh, one day he calls me and, you know, we had always stayed in touch and, you know, seen each other along the way, but he calls me and offers me a job, my intern, you know, he wasn't my intern, but right. he was the intern yeah. and offers me a job at TikTok. Oh my. And, right. you know, so back to your point of like, you know, networking, building relationships. You never know. You never know yeah. who is is going to be, um, you know, someone who's, you know, you pull people up sometimes and they pull you up other times. And I think that's what I think about a lot is like, you know, how would I want to be treated? You know, if somebody reaches out to you, on LinkedIn that maybe you've lost touch with or yeah. something. And hey, could you help me out here? You know, just trying to do that and trying to stay consistent there. And uh, I, I think, you know, I don't know that there's a, a masterful way to do it, but right. I think like that, it sounds corny, but like kindness, like, right. Well, it makes you sense because I find a lot of people, especially younger in their career, they only focus and prioritize on the people who can help them in the moment. Yeah. So you work for Procter and Gamble. Oh, I'm going to be nice to you. But if you work for a nonprofit, I'm not going to sit next to you at the exactly. conference. I'm going to look right past you. Right. And I think that's it's something that I think people don't learn until later in life is that that person can't help you today. But who knows where tomorrow is going to bring? Exactly. And even if nothing ever comes back, you feel better about yourself by helping other people right. over time. So right. it's just such a positive benefit to doing right. that. Right. Right. Exactly. And so, yeah, I just always I think, you know, great people that I've gotten to work with, but, you know, staying in touch with people, certainly, you know, text, obviously social media, all those things now help yeah, us even more. For sure. But I think it's just always been this idea of, you know, on the, on the early days, it was me like reaching out maybe to people above me or people to right and left of me, you know, but over my career, you know, even building relationships with people, you know, like I said, like an intern or, you know, at, at Google, there was a great group of folks that were on my team who were, you know, straight out of college or their MBA program. And I just, I don't know what it is. I love the the energy, the enthusiasm. Well, it comes to your the, curiosity too, right? Right. right. And, yeah. and, you know, I I remember they, um, oh God, I forget what we called them at Google, but it was this group and it was a program and they come in and they built um, like a Google slide stack on I think it was like millennial slang or Gen, Gen Z slang, one uh -huh. of them. And it was like all this slang, but we were like the olds, you know, in the group who like you're old at Google if you're over, over 30. Right. But like the olds in the group, um, we were like, take us through this, teach us. And so this whole team was like taking us through like slang and language and this and that. And I remember something, it, it, I learned enough to learn it. But or I had enough time with it to learn it. But then I remember they had to like eliminate it quickly because it wasn't like, you know, something they wanted floating around. Right. But it was just, you know, it was something of like they'd put some time and intentionality into it. And we were we were wanting to make sure that we were still staying relevant in our communications, that we were, you know, mindful about how we showed up in social. Yeah. And, you know, you have to study it. And if you're not, I just I so passionately believe that like as marketers, you have to be like a student at all times, no matter, 
if you're 50 or if you're 25. hundred percent. And that, you know, you might be 20. What's interesting right now, one of our brands, you know, one of our brands, I haven't worked on a brand this old in a long time, but like the core consumer is like a 45 year old. Right. And so to market to a 45 year old is very different than a 25 year old. And so you've got to think about, okay, put your yourself in the mindset of who that is. Where are they, you know, where are they, you know, having interceptions with marketing messages? How do we reach them best? And I think that back to the curiosity and the constantly educating yourself, uh, you just, you have to force yourself. I don't love some of the social media, you know, that I have partaken in over the years, but, right. but you have to know it. Of you, course. Like, I just don't know how you cannot know it and you be have one of hands those on keyboard. You right. have to be a practitioner. Yes. Go and figure out how to download that app on your television and search and, you know, do you like it? Do you not like it? By the way, how do the ads look on it? If there's yeah, ads, you know, totally. you just have to be in that mindset, you know, walk up and down the store aisles. My team gets crazy. But I like go on the weekends to different stores and I'll like take pictures, I'll take video, you know, here's what this looks like, here's what this looks like. Have we thought about changing this? Why, you know, you, you just you've got to you've got to stay in that mindset yeah. of the customer. And talking about staying, you know, relevant and in the right mindset. So you that intern did hire you to go yes. on TikTok and yes. you were there. Um for sure period while you're there, you were awarded at ages uh at ages market of the year yeah. uh for 2020, 2020 being a crazy year yeah. uh, in our history. Mm -hmm. What did you see about the product and and the brand that made you believe that it would achieve such success? And and what do you think TikTok's prospects are moving forward now that you're not yeah. there anymore? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I, first of all, I want to give credit to the intern who brought me to TikTok, who was uh, Nick Tran, mm -hmm. um, wonderful, you know, friend, partner, colleague. And he um, had gotten there as the global head of uh, marketing and, you know, had talked to me about coming over and so took that leap of faith and uh, went over to TikTok and uh, it was pretty crazy. It was uh, the day before I started, I believe, the uh, president uh, announced that he wanted to ban the product. Right. So it was a pretty like jarring start. Uh, Kevin Mayer was the CEO yeah. at the time who'd come over from Disney. Disney yep. And it was it was very chaotic. But I'll tell you what I thought was so interesting. I had been on Musical.ly back to right trying new products, yeah, new too. apps, right? I had been on Musical.ly what 2014, 2015, maybe 16, I don't know, somewhere in there. And I remember using Musical.ly with my kids who at the time were, you know, just very little. And so then when TikTok came and, you know, took over Musical.ly, uh, you know, I, I, I was using the product, you yeah. know, just as a consumer. And, you know, quite frankly, being at YouTube, I had my own little like research case study at home. And, and my kids at the time had been totally addicted to YouTube, like all the, you know, YouTube kids and just watching it, watching it. They knew how to work the iPads and use YouTube. All of a sudden, I saw this shift where their time spent, like, <laughs> marketer, but their time spent was going into yeah, TikTok. Yeah, like a focus group in your, in yeah. your own home, right? And I remember <laughs> being like, um, there's something going on here. And, you know, certainly, you know, YouTube didn't miss that TikTok was in existence and was growing. Yep. But I remember one day one of my kids said to me, uh, mama, I like TikTok more than YouTube. Right. And I remember just thinking like, wow, like that was fast yeah. also. Yeah. And so, um, I, I, you know, and just, I think what, what made me excited about it was like, it was, you know, obviously the short form, um, the interactiveness with like, you know, rather than maybe I'll call it the more passive of watching, you know, videos, which, you know, both excellent products, obviously, excellent right. <laughs> products, but there was a different aspect. I'll call it of like community. I think um, that was it was a different type of community than on YouTube and uh, just how like trends could break and how it didn't matter. You know, it, it you know, how you could have two followers or two instant, friends instant hit and it could be yeah. an instant hit. And I remember it must have been, I think I started in August of 2020 and in October, um, remember the guy, his name is Dogface or he goes by Dogface. 
um, the Stevie Nicks um, song, and I'm not going to remember it, but he's drinking the cranberry juice on the skateboard to the Stevie Nicks song. Or maybe it was Fleetwood Mac. But Land um, Slide, was it? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> I, I would hum it, but I don't want to. <laughs> yeah. But um, it was fascinating. You know, this person that you would never expect to even, A, be into that music. Right. B, you know, doesn't look like a kid, you know, riding on a, a skateboard. It looks like he's on his way to work. Yeah. You know, and then, and, and then drinking cranberry juice on his way. And that just became such a hit. And I remember we had built this team where we were like, we have got to move at the speed of culture. There you go. You know, there you Shout go. Out. Right. <laughs> and and we were like, we've got to be able to turn stuff around in 48 hours. Yeah. And so we we started making the calls. We reached out to him. We talked to our agency. We're like, you know, we've got NBA playoff in inventory. It was or no, was it playoffs? No, it was like October. So it must have been new. The new, the new season. Right. in the bubble. Maybe but, it was yeah. the bubble. They had the chairman oh, of the bubble. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's what it was. So we yeah. knew we had, that's right. Cause yeah. there were like September games. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yes. Cause it was September. I feel like the so, season got paused and then it didn't yes. finish until around, oh, I want to say Halloween. And then the next year. That was such a hard time. Yeah. Anyway. So, <laughs> but we had NBA inventory and we were like, let's get this in, let's get the spot made and let's get this out into the world. And it was so crazy because what we were trying to do, what we were trying to do at that time was not be banned, but also, you know, at that time, TikTok was like a kid app, yeah. right? Most people whose kids were using it so were true. even under like 12 years old. Yeah. I mean, mine like were- Like Facebook started in college, but TikTok started with 12 yeah, year olds. Yeah. yeah, and they were all doing, you know, um, Oh, the, was it Megan the Stallion? I can't, uh, Renegade. Yeah. Uh, yep. Right. Renegade. So, um, they were all doing the dances and everything. And so what we were trying to do was like show, get older audiences onto the app. I remember one of our agencies said, you're the only people trying to like get age up, right. you know, that we work right. with, but we were trying to age up. And then we were also trying to showcase the fact that like TikTok is us, right? TikTok is us. It's, you know, it's us, all right. of us and brings us together. And so um, we were able to turn that um, creative around in about 48 hours. We ended up being able to get Stevie Nicks um, onto the platform. Imagine how right? far that is from the day of going through a file cabinet and digging up research to right. your partner earlier. Exactly, right. exactly, right? We were able to get Stevie Nicks on the platform, which is great. Like she can help us age up a little bit. Um, I remember a friend of ours um, who we worked at Taco Bell together and she's, um, at a different place now, but mm. she sent a picture of her target. All the cranberry juice was sold out on the shelves. And it was just one of those moments of like, God, this platform has so much power and so much relevance. And, it, it, you know, and, 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 and I, it sounds corny, but like, it was so joyful, yeah. you know, that, that video that he made was just like, I'm chilling. I'm having a good day. It's so crazy because that juxtaposed against the yeah. the political landscape exactly. and how even to today, TikTok yes. is viewed. Exactly. And you hear state of Montana is, yeah. you know, planning on banning TikTok. So, exactly. I mean, what are your thoughts about that TikTok's yeah. role in society relative to it being a Chinese-owned company? Oh, like, yeah. I You know what? I would say, um, I think that they're having some good conversations that they should have. Yeah. So I think they need to have those Fair conversations. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I think, you know, to be honest, I just don't think we as, you know, America have really been in a situation before where we've even had to think about this. Yeah. You Most know, of the innovation in me has come from America. Come here. Yeah. And, you know, China's been kicking our companies out for decades. Yeah. You know, so, so I, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing if you step back and think about it, like they've been kicking our companies out. Um, and, and so we just haven't really gotten to that point. I don't believe, um, before where we've, we've been in this position where, yeah. you know, one of their products is so meaningful and important here. I, I will tell you, I know there'll be a lot of sad, sad folks if it leaves, but, Absolutely. um, you know, I know reels and shorts are making a run at it, but, um, I think, I think they're, it's good that they're having the conversations yeah, they are for sure. So, so let's switch gears a little bit and talk about your current role. You've had such a amazing career that took us a while to even get to what you're working know, on thank now, you, but, thank uh, you. but I'm sure all those learnings are very much relevant to your role today um, as CMO of VP of Marketing Verizon Value. Uh, for those of our audience who don't know what Verizon Value is relative yeah. to Verizon Wireless, 
what is it and I know. what are you working on there and, and yeah. where do you see the business going? Yeah, it's really, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting shift. I was talking to somebody the other day about this and, you know, Verizon value has really only existed since about January. So, um, you know, Verizon has always been Verizon and, uh, you had, you know, the wireless service, home internet, et cetera. But what has happened over time is Verizon's been very purposeful. Um, I'll, I'll say about two paths. One was, I'll call it innovation with visible and, and thinking about back to like that idea of following the puck. Where is our consumer going to be five years, 10 years from yeah. now? And so how do we get wireless service to our customers if our young, you know, Gen Z alphas, millennials, don't want to go in stores anymore right? and don't want to sit on hold with 1-800 numbers. So Visible was established sort of to, to play that out and to see like, could we bring, you know, wireless service to people in an all digital way? And then by doing so, you know, pass the savings along to those it's customers. Kind of like what digital banks are doing right now for consumers as well. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, so there was that aspect that was already brewing, but then the secondary piece was that, Verizon actually acquired TrackPhone at the end of 21. Uh -huh. And, you know, TrackPhone, I'd heard of TrackPhone before. I think Me a lot too. of people yeah. have. What I didn't know was TrackPhone is like a house of brands. And so there's TrackPhone, Straight Talk, Total, Simple, many other brands that really served what we call the, the prepaid community. And, and I'm going to guess probably a lot of people listening to this podcast probably are what we call postpaid. You mm -hmm. get, you get your bill from your wireless carrier and you pay it when it comes. Right. But with prepaid, you basically, I call it more, a little bit more like a Netflix, but right. you pay and then you get your 30 days and then you pay and you get your 30. days. And so it gives people more flexibility. You exactly, can stop paying and it turns off and right. exactly, exactly. And so Verizon value was created to put all these brands together and make sure that we're looking at them, you know, across the portfolio and, and what consumer segments and targets are we going to serve? And, you know, maybe visible is right for our digital savvy. Goes back to your fascination with demographics. Yes, exactly. Right. And now I'm like selling wireless service to 45 year olds. Right? right. So, you know, and we've got another brand that, you know, is targeted a little bit older. And so, um, and then we also look at channel, right? So the, the, the unique difference I'd say with Verizon value too, is that, um, we, we don't own all our distribution. So like a CPG company, we are reliant on Walmart, retailers yeah. like Walmart, Target, yeah. Best Buy, hence my video and photography, <laughs> you know, going into all these locations on weekends because we're reliant on how we're merchandised there what part of the store we're in, what competitors we're next to, and how much space they do or don't want to give with us, give us and how they want to work with us. So it's it's a it's a very different like business model um than, you know, I'll call it the maybe traditional Verizon. Which is a more vertically integrated solution. Exactly. You're in the retail. Although even in the traditional model, you still have your authorized distributors as yes, well. Right? Yes, yes, exactly. So yeah, so we put the, the so the, the team put the Verizon Value Org together. Angie Klein, who is um a wonderful person as well, 23 years at Verizon. Uh, she is the CEO and president of Verizon Value, and mm -hmm. then I lead marketing, rolling into her for these brands. Got and it. so um, that's a little bit so, about- So where do you see the wireless space going? I mean, you have 5G, yeah. you have now people, I, I, I forget what the terminology is, but instead of running cable into the household, you're basically just right. putting 5G in the house and you're streaming TV in general. You don't even need traditional cable anymore. Exactly. So, I mean, I think that the space is going to be completely different in the next 10 years. As oh, was. yeah. So how does that impact your go-to-market strategy, the products you're selling to the consumers, right. maybe how you're bundling it, et cetera? Exactly, exactly. So yeah, so one of the interesting things to, to your point about how it's changing in 5G you know, when we were moving from 3G to 4G, or I mean, my goodness, even probably 2G, mm -hmm. right? Remember how like every two years you'd get a new phone? Oh, yeah. I got to get a phone. I got to get a new phone, right? You know, the phone sales are are declining because, you know, now that we're at about 4 and 5G, pretty much everywhere, um, you know, the, the people are turning over their phones less. And so, um, you know, Verizon obviously has led in network I'll call it dominance yes. for a long time and that it has had great reputation for that. So what one of the things we're looking at is, you know, how can we bring that network dominance to be to be blunt 
into these value segments, right? right? And, you know, provide these customers who, you know, I always say you could walk in with a, a handful of quarters at Walmart and buy one of our plans. And we will not do credit checks. We are not going to, you know, require all the things that a postpaid customer would have to do. And they can get that service for 30 days and they can get it on the Verizon network. So that's one thing is how do we, you know, uh, you know, get more people onto our network. Basically expand your total addressable market. Exactly. Right. And then also, you know, the team is working a lot on fixed wireless, as you said. So back to, you know, at home, not having the cords and the cables and all of that, but, you know, kind of like having a, a super big uh, mobile hotspot. Right. Right. That's that exactly you just have in your house. Right. You know, and, and with like YouTube TV, which you exactly. know better than anyone else, like you combine those two together oh. and it's a completely different oh, yeah. way to get content. Yeah. Develop. We're Sunday ticket subscribers yeah, as of Sunday on yep. YouTube TV. Yep. My husband was so reluctant. We were, sorry, tangent, but like direct TV subs for over 20 years. Yep. Per- for that. I got, I put a sa- I hung a satellite outside my yeah. apartment building and got fined so I could see my Philadelphia exactly. Eagles line with New York. I it, got, I'm I got it. Send, I had this big satellite. They put it up myself. So yep. I remember all that. Yep. So, and yeah. I, we, the funny thing was we had YouTube TV the whole time, but my husband would on, insist on watching direct TV. And I'm like, do you know how much? Anyway, right. I, I won't <laughs> turn into that right, side. But, right. <laughs> but anyway, so we are Sunday ticket subscribers as of Sunday afternoon. He's learning the new user interface, yeah. but it'll be good. But to your point, it's all changing. Right. And, and I, I think what's exciting to me about that is it's going to give us like more addressability with how we can reach our consumers in their homes yeah. or their places where they're living uh, and, and just make us all more mobile. I was um, somebody the other day was talking about, I think it was someone in Florida that we work with that that he's a Starlink subscriber and he drives around on like road trips with it, yeah, you know, and just the the mobility that it will allow us all to have in the connectivity. So I think, you know, value is here to like bring, I'll call it bring, you know, this great network and then bring ease and flexibility, you know, to a lot of different people who have different needs. Some of our customers are, are literally just fresh coming into the country and they have a phone that does not work and they go to the bodega, they pick up a simple phone plan card and now they're connected. Yeah. You know, some of our folks are senior citizens who just want, you know, talk and they want to flip so phone. So you basically need different applications for different yeah. segments of the population based yeah. upon their unique needs. Exactly. Yeah. And di- different ways to pay. Like, can right. they pay through PayPal, Cash App? You know, um, I, you know, yes, they can pay in cash, like however they want to pay and having different ways to pay. And I think what I what I like to think about with our space is there's a lot of choice and flexibility. And, um, you know, we're even looking at things like if you pay your 30 days, but, you know, maybe your next payday is another four days out. Right. You know, we're we're looking at programs where like we will, you know, cover your data during that time to like carry you over so that you don't lose your number and have to sign up again. So we're looking at different opportunities like that. So I imagine a big part of that is just listen, going back to curiosity, listen to your consumer, understanding their lives, their needs. Right. So you can meet them where they are. Exactly. Exactly. The power of the network. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. It's it's yeah, because I mean I mean I'm we're even getting down into are you paid every Friday? Are you paid on the first and the fifteenth? Like, and it makes a big difference to folks, of course. you know, who are in that space and a couple of days really can make or break you. So making sure that we're building, we call it the products, but yeah. building the the plans the to be able to right. um, support people who have different needs and then, uh, you know, giving them great service. Yeah, absolutely. So shifting gears as we wrap up here, I mean, you've had an amazing career. And as you mentioned earlier, you don't know where you're even going next, but it right. sounds like, uh, you know, you have such great experience and, and there's a million places that you can take the Verizon business um, and beyond. As you look back on your career, you talked about curiosity as being a big driver of your success. What are some mm-hmm. other things that you'd point to in terms of decisions that you made right along the way? That helped oh, you get to where you are today yeah. in the CMO role. Yeah. Um, you know, something I don't know if it was a decision I made at the time, yeah. but looking back, right, something that I don't know that I knew was as valuable coming up as I see it now and think, huh, that is really good. So I would say this is working with someone that, you know, is your your boss, your leader and having confidence and respect 
and like safety with that person. Someone who is an advocate of you, you know, is your direct manager. Like You're saying choosing who you go to work yeah, for based upon those attributes. Yeah, yeah, choosing who you go to work for. And then also, you know, it, it can't always just be that one person because people change, right? Yeah. But then who else are the leaders? Who else are the leaders of that company? And are they people that you respect, admire, think are incredible people? And what I've found is when I've worked at companies where the answers are all yes, like massive success and massive, you know, just growth and opportunity. And, you know, you know, sometimes people are at companies where, you know, maybe the leadership isn't the best. I, I remember early, early on in my career, um, I worked at Coca-Cola and, and no, no, no shame to the leadership, but I think we had three CEOs in like 18 months. Right. And it was a period of big, big change for the company. And that, you know, that was tough. And so, you know, it, it's, it, it makes you, you know, tougher and stronger to go through tough business as well as great business. But I'd say looking at that direct manager and, you know, what's your relationship with that person? Did they, do they support you? Do they want to lift you up? Do they want to grow you? Yeah, and then in your growth, and the in people your around you. Yeah. The people around them. And, uh, you know, and it may sound corny, but like, even do their values align with your values? Yes. Yeah. Right. And, and are they someone you would be proud to, you know, be on a team with? And so I think that's something really important to look at. I love that. So, so fin finally here, uh, Cheryl, if you had a quote or mantra, that oh, you gosh. like live by. We always yeah. end up our podcast with this question because I think it's a good way to sum up how people look at their careers or their personal life. What comes to mind? First yeah. thing that comes to mind, no wrong answer. Yeah. You know, I, I, I would always think of, I'd say the curiosity is a big one. Yeah. Right. But I think that leads to like saying yes. Right. And like take, taking some chances. Yeah. And, and taking some chances. And you know what? I like there have been times where an opportunity has come my way. And I even have thought like, oh, I don't want to leave this company right, right now, you know, but, but saying yes, taking that leap of faith and, and trying, I think. So I, I'd say the, the, you know, say yes to your curiosity yeah, or something I like that. I love that. That's fantastic. So, you made up a new yeah, motto there we right go. on the spot. So <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you so much for joining. It's been a fantastic thank discussion you. and uh, cannot wait for our audience to hear it. Uh, on behalf of Susie and Adwee team, thanks again to Cheryl Gresham, CMO and VP of Marketing Rise and Value for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the Speed of Culture podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Till next time, see you soon, everyone. Take care. Speed of Culture is brought to you by Suzy as part of the Adweek Podcast Network and A Guest Creator Network. You can listen and subscribe to all Adweek's podcasts by visiting adweek.com slash podcasts. To find out more about Suzy, head to suzy.com. And make sure to search for the Speed of Culture in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Click follow so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Suzy, thanks for listening.